Jean's thoughts of Yelon's tactics had been within the limits of too harsh, but Ganyu and Kuching's own separate thoughts on the matter remained the same. In their minds, there was no forgiveness possible, and Reshav, despite his reactions to the torture he'd endured turning out to be only an act of mockery, had deserved everything he'd gotten. However, in their victory came a whole new can of worms that made the horrors of the night Leeway Harbor was sunk seem mild in comparison. Androids. Hundreds of them. All being powered by divine energy and strength. This whole new threat had changed everything, and the only way to stop it was currently a mystery to all of them. Minus Yelon. She'd led Ganyu and Kuching all the way to Sumeru City for some reason that they could only hope was a lead in the seemingly hopeless battle, and now stood before the entrance to the well-known school of scholars, sages, and professors known as the Academia. It was the equivalent of trying to get into a private party or gathering, having been halted from entering just a foot's length from the double door entrance. Luckily for them, Yelan was a master of persuasion and had gotten the guard to at least fetch someone that could lead them to a place that related to the severed head of Reshov Starchovsky. They'd been waiting patiently for about 10 minutes before the double doors had finally opened again, the guard they'd sent leading another person through the doorway. The new company was a tall, middle-aged man dressed in the attire worn by the most experienced professors of the academia, his skin tan, face styled with a black goatee, and his eyes adorned with thin, framed glasses. It was clear just by his appearance that he'd been a teacher of the establishment for a long period of time. Upon his approach, Yelan shifted her body to a proper posture that the scholars of the academia deemed respectful in a first meeting, to which Ganyu and Kuching followed by copying to avoid any chance of giving a bad first impression. The guard and professor halted just a foot from Yelan, said guard beginning the greeting with a proper introduction. This is Professor Oswalch, our most experienced scholar in the field of mechanics and machinery. The guard introduced. If there is anyone in Sumeru who can potentially help you with your issue, it's him. Greetings. Oswalch followed up. What may I help you ladies with today? Yelan took that as her opening to finally speak, so she followed up with a careful choice of words. Salutations, Professor. I simply need help in dissecting a microchip from a failed experiment. Oswald expressed a look of amusement, having not expected an answer as such. Interesting. However, microchips are normally pretty easy to extract, ma'am. Why is my assistance required? Yelon gave Oswatch a look that gave him full clarity that her next words were absolutely serious in every single matter. Because I didn't design it, a once friend of mine did. She won't talk to me, and I don't want to damage or corrupt anything within its memory or data, sir. I plan to use it for another version of the old design, but better. Oswatch caught her message and followed with a nod of his head. I see. Well then, please follow me to my office. We can discuss more there and get a good idea on what I may need to do to get the chip out correctly. Alright, sir. Yelan assured, to which she, Ganyu, and Kuching followed. The professor led them into the building, past the main lobby area, and into another room with a long, narrow walkway. Off to the sides of the single walkway were two sets of stairs that led them down to the ground floor area, to which he turned right and directed them down the right set of stairs. From the ground floor, he led the three to a door, opened it wide, and closed it tight upon the three ladies being clear of the doorway. Inside the room was a small and messy space that was littered with mechanical stripped parts, worn books with crippling spines, and yellowed pages, and a single screen that lined the entire farthest wall. It was a sight that had bewildered Ganyu the most, having never seen such an advanced technological component before. She'd heard of such gadgets existing via past conversations she'd overheard while out on her usual break, but never had any interest or desire to ever see one. 
The closest thing she'd ever seen or used that could be classified as advanced technology is a camera. And even the magical ability for a device to capture a moment in time with a flash of a light baffled her ancient mind. The room suddenly erupted into light upon Oswald switching on the massive machine that covered the entire north wall, static present on the screen, eventually fading to a screen with only the insignia of the Academia present on the screen. Upon the screen meeting its default screen, he turns to Yalon with a serious look. All right, before we continue, I need to know what your true intentions are with this. You don't strike me as the engineering type, and I know you have different intentions. Yalon knew she'd been found out, but despite the foiling of her disguise as a mere amateur inventor, she just smiled and chuckled. <laughs> Figures a major of your level would figure me out easily. All right, then. I'll give you the honest truth. This microchip is part of an android that is responsible for my once home's eradication. And to prevent any other nation from disappearing from existence, I need to know where it came from and analyze everything stored in its memory. I plan to do nothing malicious, Professor. I just want to figure out the origins of the microchip and the data stored on it. It could potentially save this place from a Snow Witch's plan to wipe it off the map. Is that enough information for you? Yalon gave it straight, making sure her goals and intentions were clear, as much as the potential consequences if he disagreed to helping her further. Her words had put Oswalch into a state of unease, having caught on to her message that she wasn't fibbing about anything clear as day. Plenty. And while I'm not entirely sure what is going on, I can tell you are being completely honest. He responded, wiping sweat from his brow out of intimidation. Normally, I'd just send anyone else packing, but you have convinced me enough to believe you. Therefore, I'll do my best to help you. Wise decision. Galen added, moving to her bag currently hanging from her right shoulder. She opened the bag and pulled out the head of Reshov Starchovsky, causing Oswalch to flinch, but calmed upon seeing the severed wires hanging from where the neck was cleanly cut. He eyed the head for a moment before grabbing it from Yalon's grasp, clearly impressed at how much it seemed like a real human head. Very interesting. This creation is in no doubt the most realistic that I've ever seen and was in no doubt created by someone that is a master of this type of craft. This has been modified in a way that I can't quite describe, and is of the highest rank of mechanical engineering I've ever seen in my years. Even going outside of the usual blueprint, or even the most common type of robot or android. Something like a hybrid, or a custom. Something that only a heavily experienced engineer could even successfully create. Do you think you can still fulfill my request? No doubt I can, but given the design of this, it may take me a little bit of time to disassemble everything I need in order to reach the brain of this particular android. The design of this assembly of parts and circuits is very specific, as if it were designed to only be modified by one individual. It's the equivalent of a lab rat trying to escape a maze and needs to be disassembled very carefully to avoid any potential built-in security coding or triggers that can activate if I make one tiny mistake. That sounds dangerous, but fits the original source that this machine came from perfectly. Are you sure you can do this without potentially endangering yourself and the students of the academia? If I take my time and analyze every bit of the circuitry as I work, it shouldn't be an issue. Besides, I wouldn't disassemble it here. I'd take it to my underground workshop in the rainforest. That way, no students end up hurt if I'm a step, and my shop is deep enough to not harm any life in the wilderness. Yalon nodded in agreement at his show of sincerity on the matter. All right, Professor. You've convinced me. However, 
I can't afford to just let you potentially run off with our most critical chance at stopping Tabat's impending destruction. Therefore, I'll be going along with you to this workshop, and will be watching your every move while working. Oswalch didn't object, and just nodded his head in agreement. I can accept that, though I must warn you that this could take me days to do, depending on how secured the microchip is. I have all the time in the world, so I can afford a few days of making sure things go just fine. As for my colleagues... Yelon turned to face Ganyu and Kuching, a smile of assurance on her face. I'm sure that you two don't want to spend up to three days underground in a cluttered space. Ganyu and Kuching caught the message. She was inquiring them to stay behind and watch for any suspicious activity that Oswald may manage to get past her hawk-like eyes and senses. They saw it and nodded in agreement, to which Yelan winked at them to assure that they had caught her intentions correctly. Yelan turned back to Oswald. It's settled then. When's the latest we can start towards this workshop? As soon as I finish my shift which is in about another four hours. Very well. I'll go get these girls settled in for the next few days, and I'll meet you outside the building at the base of the first set of steps in four hours. Sounds like a plan. He finished, handing the head back to Yelon. Yelon accepted the mechanical cranium of Reshov, sticking it back into her bag and turning to the exit. I do hope our business ends in a success, Mr. Oswalch. Yelon concluded, moving back to the door and opening it wide to allow her colleagues to exit. Once Ganyu and Kuching had made their way out, Yelon took her own leave, closing the door tight and leading her fellow associates back outside of the building at the normal walking pace she'd entered with. Once outside and down the walkway that led back to the city below, Yelan led her two comrades to Puspa Cafe. It was a small building right up from the Sumeru City docks, and upon the three moving into the establishment, an aroma of many Middle Eastern dishes embraced their senses like a warm hug. A multitude of scents from spicy and exotic foreign dishes engulfed their nostrils, immediately causing their clear hunger to become evident. At least that was the case for Kuching and Yelan, their stomachs having grumbled like a restless person getting up early in the morning. Ganyu had appeared repulsed by the scents of clear meat-oriented dishes that she had gained a slight sense of nausea from. You, you two go ahead, Ganyu said, clearly trying to hide her nausea out of respect. I'm, I'm going to go see if the nearby fields have anything to offer. Before the two could answer or comment, Ganyu had already exited the building, to which Kuching took the initiative to explain to a clearly confused Yelon. <laughs> uh, let's get a table, and I'll explain everything. She sheepishly explained. Yelon just agreed, leading her attendant to a table in a far corner where their conversation wouldn't be heard easily by eavesdropping. Upon seating themselves, Kuching laid her arms lazily upon the table's surface and explained the reason why Ganyu had taken herself elsewhere. Yelan had been surprised at the information, having known little about the Chilin or their strict vegetarian diet. Less to say, she had taken the lesson to heart and swore to be more thoughtful of Ganyu's preferred non-meat lifestyle. After the lesson had been closed, the two had been served and had placed their orders for the thing that seems the most appetizing to their stomachs. Yelan had ordered some kind of spiced rice dish, while Kuching had went more simple with an exotic meat dish. She usually didn't order a serving as such with her half adeptus co-worker around, so seeing she had free reign, she took the opportunity to try a new thing that she wasn't sure she'd like. The waiter and owner of the cafe had said it was a high-selling favorite of the customers, so she figured that was enough to confirm that she wouldn't be wasting more on a meal that was far from cheap. Their food wouldn't be ready for a good while, 
so Yelan had decided to take that time to speak her thoughts with her trusted colleague. So, what did you think of our professor friend, Lady Kuching? She asked in a voice that clearly answered how she felt about Oswald. Kuching was a little confused at first, up until she realized what Yelan meant, speaking her views on their new compadre. I think he's suspicious. She answered simply. Yelan nodded her head with a smile. I'm glad I'm not the only one who could see it. Yelan added. He agreed too easily and didn't even question the whole Tevat's destruction part of the equation. Indeed. Something felt wrong the entire time we were there. As if he knew who we were and why we were there in the first place. Kuching admitted. Do you think he's connected to our current situation? No. I highly doubt he has any connection to it. Yelan answered. <laughs> I've dealt with plenty of the Fatus, and he didn't act like any of them. Not even the most amateur ones I've faced. It's more like he's aware of where our piece of Reshov came from, and wants to extract the microchip for further information. Kuching pondered for a second on what to say, analyzing and breaking apart Yelan's hypothesis carefully and connecting the dots. If I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that he isn't involved with the Fatui or the Saritza, but is more interested in the assumption that the microchip and its contents are connected to the Fatui and the Saritza. Exactly, but... Even if he may appear as a curious scholar looking to learn more about a more advanced technological android that was created by some mad bastard, we cannot assume he's just that. Given the Saritza is looking to start a war with an army of god-powered androids, the fact that our enemy turned out to be one of them, and that meaning that anybody we could interact with could also be an android, means that she set up her defenses to protect her position. Protect her position? Kuching questioned with a raised eyebrow. I... I don't understand. Think about it as if you were in the Sarita's position. You'd want your eyes to be everywhere, watching to see if anything were on the rise of potentially interfering with your plans. It's clear that the army she's building is not complete, because there's been no other reported major attacks. She's also in need of the other Archons' energy to execute her plans, so as long as we prevent her from getting the Archons, nothing happens. That means, from here onward, we must be careful with what we say, which is why I waited until I was absolutely sure our professor friend wasn't one of our spies to say anything regarding our situation. We can't let the Saritza have any advantages to advance her plans. So from now on, everybody besides the people we have associated with prior are a potential enemy. Kuching understood and agreed with a nod, adding her own thoughts to the mix. That said, do you think we may be being watched as we speak? Most likely, but I'm not worried about it. She claimed. But what about androids like Reshav? Kuching countered. They aren't your average spies and exist to kill. Gela nodded. Fair point, but I doubt they'd attack in a place with many witnesses. She replied. It would cause a rupture in the Saritza's plan, seeing it would lead to an investigation into the Fatui, thereby halting any process in her ploys. Just keep your eyes open, and once the time is right, we'll deal with them. All right, my eyes are open. Kuching agreed. Excellent. Upon the conclusion of their conversation, Yelan and Kuching awaited their food's arrival. It came around ten minutes later, two steaming plates being placed carefully in front of them and following with a much-deserved feasting of their separate dishes. Kuching had a cube of the exotic meat forked and ready for her taste buds to dance at, up until she thought of something and halted any further action of eating her meal. Wait! 
she warned, managing to stop her colleague before she managed to ingest any of her spiced rice. If you're worried about our food being poisoned or anything, you can rest your thoughts. Galen assured calmly. Kuching was shocked. Galen had practically read her mind before she could even say anything. But, but how can you be so sure? Kuching questioned, still unsure about even touching her meal. Poisoning two former Liwei Harbor government officials in a public space would only stir up problems for the Saritsa. Given the whole disaster with Hosile and the 11th Harbinger, it would be a divot in the Saritsa's motives, leading to her plan for Tevat's doomsday to be put on hold. I guess that makes sense? Kuching replied unsurely. Exactly. So don't worry about being killed by poisoned food and just eat. Yelan assured, taking her long-awaited bite of her sweet and spicy delicacy. I've, uh, suddenly lost my appetite. Yelan just shrugged and continued to eat, completely unaffected by any potential deadly ingredients. After having their fill, Kuching and Yelan exited the establishment, finding Ganyu rather easily. She was seated on a bench just outside, a light smile on her face while admiring the sights and folk of Sumeru City. Upon Yelan and Kuching's exit, Ganyu's gaze turned to her fellow comrades, getting up from the bench and walking to their position. Did you two have a nice lunch? She asked. Well... I certainly did. Galem replied. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the Yuhung, however. Galen's gaze turned to Kuching, standing with a look of guilt on her face. I'd rather not risk my life over food. Kuching defended. Ganyu raised an eyebrow. Why would you face any risk of danger with restaurant food? Ganyu questioned. Yelan followed up by explaining how any stranger could be an android spy of the Saritsa, along with how Kuching was being too paranoid about her food that had gone to waste. Ganyu could understand Kuching's reasoning, and followed with something her colleague wasn't expecting. Um, uh, how about I make you something later? Ganyu offered shyly. That way... You know, nothing is wrong with it. Kuching looked completely surprised at the offer, having never assumed Ganyu a cook at all. However, her surprised expression shifted to a look of assurance, confident Ganyu wasn't just saying that because she just felt bad for her. I'd love that. Kuching accepted with a smile. Ganyu jumped at the answer, clearly happy, but also embarrassed. Oh, uh, uh, good. I, uh, I pr promise to make it as, uh, as tasty as possible. Yelan playfully rolled her eyes at the two, finding it cute and entertaining to watch. <laughs> All right, girls, this is where we go separate ways. Yelan stated, watch yourselves. And here, you'll need this. Yelan dug her right hand into her bag and pulled out a small sack that rang the sound of clinking coins. She tossed it to Kuching, then continued to speak. Extra more that'll get you two by in the time I'll be gone. Make sure to spend it wisely, and remember to watch what you say in regards to why we're here. Kuching caught and stored the extra currency away safely on her person, nodding her head in agreement. You be careful as well, Miss Yelan. She added with a serious tone. We need you in this fight, so stay safe and alive. <laughs> it's going to take a hell of a lot more than some mechanics professor to take me out, Lady Kuching. But I'll be sure to watch myself out there. Yelan agreed. 
All right. We'll see you in a few days. Kuching concluded as a goodbye. Catch you ladies then. Galon finished, then turned in the direction of the academia, disappearing into the crowds of Sumeru City's citizens. Once Jalon had fully departed, Kuching turned to Ganyu and spoke. Let's go check into the inn first. Then we can go to the local markets and get what you need for what you plan to cook tonight. Ganyu nodded in agreement, following with the two taking off deeper into the bowels of Sumeru's capital, not sure what to expect in the coming days of Yelon's absence. The ingredients that Ganyu had needed for her special dish had barely made a dent in the extra mora Yelon had left them, the produce having been mainly an assortment of fruits and freshly picked Sumeru roses that she had found in her time alone during lunchtime. To be exact, while Yelon and Kuching had been in the restaurant, she'd gone for a walk just outside of the borders of the city and had eaten a few select plants she knew were safe to consume. Ganyu had heard of Sumeru roses, but had never actually gotten to try one herself. She had expected the purple vegetation to be bitter and juicy to her taste buds, but upon trying one, was surprised that it actually had a slight sweetness to it, mixed with a very mild amount of bitterness. She had been correct about the juiciness, the petals of the flower having burst with liquid upon the slightest contact with her teeth. The watery substance was what gave the flower its slight sweetness, and upon chewing the single bite to nothing but bits, the bitterness and sweetness mixed into a concoction that Ganyu couldn't compare to any other sort of food or drink she'd consumed in her entire life. But she had liked it, and had decided to gorge herself with another good number of them. After ten, she had found herself completely stuffed, which had caught her off guard. The flower was relatively small in size, so, it was quite a shock that only 10 had satisfied her stomach. However, it had also relieved her, given that, due to the width of her hips, she had once choked a giant monster to death. An event that had made her become very self-aware of her weight and appearance constantly. If 10 of these small delicacies could fill her and not make her slowly become obese, she definitely would have to make some more trips to Sumeru to collect some more. That said, the experience of consuming the treat had given her an idea. Given that the flower had a heavy amount of liquid that produced a sweet and bitter taste, she wondered if she could make it into a drink. It was a silly thought, but given all of the chaos currently enveloping the world, she figured, why the hell not? Ganyu wasn't usually the creative type, so for her to even try something like making a personal Chilin appropriate beverage was rare and embarrassed her to even bother telling Kuching about it. Therefore, she just kept the idea to herself while preparing a dish for her colleague. The serving was a recipe she'd learned from a friend in her past, consisting of mainly fruits like apples, sunsetias, and berries, sprinkled with cinnamon and sugar for extra flavor. However, the fruits were mildly heated to give a tenderness and the last addition was a thick sauce made of all of the assortment that the consumer would dip the sliced contents into. Ganyu had tried the dish before and had loved it, the flavor profile being a mix of a pungent sweetness that was evened out by the cinnamon, adding a slight spiciness to the mix. Just thinking about the flavor made Ganyu lick her chops, standing above a blazing fire. A metal plate adorned the flame's tips, a steel pan resting on its surface and mildly steaming. The steaming signaled that it was time to pull it off, to which Ganyu used some of her crowd energy to cool the pan handle and moved it from the fire pit to the side. Everything was prepared, Kuching having assisted her in doing some of the work, mainly the fruit sauce that took a bit of work to get to its current state. Kuching had no problem in helping, seeing she was hungry and actually excited for what Ganyu had in mind. The smell coming from the pan was absolutely delectable and made her stomach growl in anticipation, and as she waited for her plate, eyed the stars in the sky. 
They had to go outside of town for Ganyu to cook her meal, but they didn't mind, given they were used to the wilderness at this point. It was currently twilight, and there wasn't one cloud in the sky, making the setting perfect. A calm in the seemingly eternal storm that had become their top priority, something that both of them needed drastically. Upon her friend meeting her by the blazing fire, she smiled. They need a couple minutes to cool. Ganyu clarified, taking a seat next to Kuching. Other than that, it's done. All right. Kuching agreed, returning her gaze to the night sky. <sighs> Beautiful night tonight, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. Ganyu responded with a nod. Seems that the rumors are true about Sumeru. Kuching shifted, an eyebrow raised. Huh? Rumors? Rumors of what? Oh, that the sky is so clear at night that you can see every single star in the sky. Ganyu explained. Ah, I see. Kuching replied. Well, then in that case, I have to agree. Ganyu giggled in the clear over-professionalism, knowing her colleague all too well. What? What's so funny? Kuching questioned. <laughs> the fact that only you would respond that way. Ganyu explained with another giggle. <laughs> only the Yu Hung would act so serious about something so small. Kuching's face adorned a light blush instantly. Embarrassed that her old habits had shown through. <laughs> Sorry. Force of habit. Kuching apologized. Ganyu giggled again. <laughs> it's fine. If anything, it just reminds me of the days before this whole mess. And that's a good thing. A silence followed. The two just taking a moment to take in the sights that Tevat's sky had to offer. It was a peaceful serenity that gave them a moment to reminisce of the good times before the Saritsa decided to tear everything they loved and adored to nothing but bloody shreds of loss and grief. A minute passed, up until Kuching averted her gaze and broke the silence. Ganyu, can I ask you something? Ganyu turned to her colleague, surprised at the sudden mention of her name. Um, sure. What is it? Ganyu answered. Why did you suddenly offer to do this for me? I've never seen you cook, nor would I even have ever guessed you were a cooking type. Ganyu paused to find the right words, not too sure herself why she'd offered this. However, the answer came quicker than she'd expected, eyeing Kuching with a smile upon her response. Well, because you're my friend, and I care for you. She responded slowly. Besides Lady Yelon, you're all I have left in this world, and I want to show you that I do care for you by being the best friend I can be. Kuching adorned another blush. This wasn't the Ganyu she'd known back in Liwei Harbor. She'd changed drastically in the midst of all the tragedy that had befallen both of them within a week's time. But that wasn't a bad thing to her. If anything, it made her feel like there was purpose for her existence, and that Ganyu really did care that she was here with her. Back in Liwei Harbor, she'd always had the assumption that Ganyu hated her, and that she'd only gotten along with her for the sake of getting through whatever they had been assigned. It was understandable due to her views on the gods, but there had always been something about Ganyu that she couldn't explain. Something she had always wanted to know from day one of their first meeting. Before she could get a word out, Ganyu had beaten her to the punch. The food should be ready now. Wait here. Coming out of her distant thoughts of the past, Kuching nodded, watching as Ganyu got up and walked away to prep her a plate of whatever she had specifically made for her. Less than a minute later, 
Ganya returned with two plates resting atop both of her gloved hands. A very evident smell similar to that of peach cobbler or apple pie emanated from each plate, causing Kuching's stomach to rumble at the delicious and sweet scent. Here you go, Ganyu said, handing the right plate to her colleague. I, I hope you like it. Kuching took the plate and rested it in her lap, smiling at the sight of her friend's generous gift. You're silly. It smells and looks great, Ganyu. Kuching assured, gripping the fork and preparing a first bite. She chose a berry and stabbed it with her fork moving it to the small dollop of sauce in a corner of her plate. Following that, she proceeded with dipping it, and finished by blowing on her serving to prevent her tongue from getting singed. Upon the mixture meeting her tongue, she was met with a barrage of flavors. A sweetness with a mix of the sauce and berry, layered with a slight spice that evened out the sugary mix. The berry was soft and juicy to her teeth, and upon swallowing the mixture, was met with an aftertaste that was just the perfect cherry on top. G Ganyu, th this is amazing! Why don't you cook more often? Ganyu blushed and rubbed the back of her neck in shyness. Uh, um, I guess I have no confidence. Kuching shook her head in disappointment. Take it from me. You definitely have the skill. This is one of the best things I've ever ate. Well, I'm glad you like it. Eventually, Ganyu found her footing and joined Kuching in dining on the personally cooked dish. It had been clear Kuching hadn't been lying, seeing the entirety of her plate had been consumed in less than 10 minutes. She knew her co-worker well, and knew she wasn't the type to force-eat something she doesn't like. She would immediately push the plate away and state she doesn't like it, so Ganyu was able to eat in peace. After the two had finished their dinner, it had gotten late, and to avoid getting attacked by any animals or hilly trolls, they put out the fire, packed up, and made their way back to their room at the inn. The walk was only a 20-minute one, and upon meeting their room door, opened it, walked in, and closed it. Making sure it was locked, Kuching and Ganyu retired for the night, taking turns to change into their nightwear. Ganyu had been second, closing the bathroom door and beginning to undress herself. Upon removing her day clothes, all that was left was her bra and underwear, to which she started to maneuver herself into the nightgown. Once her head was through, and she was sure that her horns were clear of the head hull, she finished by allowing her icy locks freedom of the hair tie that held them together. Her hair spread out like a secondary blanket, extending down past her hips and over her shoulders, concluding her nightly rituals and exiting the bathroom. Stepping back into the main room, Ganyu immediately knew something wasn't right. Kuching was sitting on the edge of one of the beds with her head down, a sight Ganyu knew as one that didn't spell out any positive vibes. Kuching, are you okay? She asked with concern. Is something wrong? For a second, Kuching didn't say anything, but eventually her head rose slowly to meet Ganyu's gaze. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. She lied, hoping to persuade Ganyu. Upon her colleague folding her arms, Kuching knew she failed to even convince her the slightest bit. Kuching, don't lie to me. I can read it on your face. Kuching knew she was defeated, lowering her head with a heavy sigh. <sighs> Fine. She admitted in defeat, raising her head again. It's a uh, thought. I had back at the camp. Ganyu was curious, but also confused, eyeing her friend with eyes of worry. Okay, what is it? Ganyu asked. Another heavy sigh escaped Kuching, speaking the truth at last. <sighs> uh, Ganyu, 
be honest with me. Have you ever hated me? Ganyu jumped at the words, unsure of what she had just heard. Where did this thought come from all of a sudden? Kuching, what do you mean? Ganyu asked with absolute confusion. Back before this, when we still worked for Ningguang, did you ever truly hate me because of what I said about the gods? Mainly Rex Lapis? Kuching explained further. Ganyu was shook, realizing exactly what Kuching was saying. No, I never hated you. Ganyu started. Yes, we had our different views of the gods, but it's not something I could ever truly hate anyone for, Kuching. Why would you ever think this? Because you... You always seemed, at least in my eyes, like you did not want anything to do with me back then. And I can't accept with a clear conscience all that you've done for me, when all I did was act like a rude bitch that didn't care about your feelings. Ganyu approached her comrade and took a seat next to her on the edge of the bed. It's not that I never wanted anything to do with you but because I didn't want to overstep my boundaries, seeing we had different views. Ganyu explained. However, when we were out in the field together, none of that was on my mind. I enjoyed those times and really considered you a close friend the more we went on those missions together. And the same goes for now, Kuching. Despite all of the chaos and tragedy lingering over our heads, I am glad I found you that night, and don't regret saving your life. I'd do it all over again if I had to, and I promise, I'll always be by your side to the day that we avenge Leeway Harbor. What about after that? Kuching questioned. Will you still be there then? Ganyu placed her right hand over the top of Kuching's left, eyeing her with a smile. Always. In a sudden shift, something happened that Ganyu hadn't expected. Kuching had turned and planted her soft lips to Ganyu's own, causing the recipient's eyes to bulge in shock and surprise. The kiss lasted only a couple seconds before Kuching realized what she had done, pulling away in absolute disgust at herself. I... I'm so sorry, Ganyu. She apologized instantly, averting her gaze and trying not to cry. I... I need to go. Kuching started to her feet, attempting to move to the exit. However... Before she could get a foot forward, she was pulled back by Ganyu, her left hand gripping her right wrist. Stay. Ganyu stated sincerely. But, but Ganyu, I... I want you to stay. Ganyu assured calmly. Kuching hadn't expected this type of response but she could tell Ganyu was serious by the look on her face and her tone of voice. Slowly, Kuching untensed her muscles fighting against Ganyu's grip and allowed herself to calm down. With a few breaths and her heart racing, she turned to look back at her colleague with an unsure expression. Are you sure you want me to stay? Ganyu followed up by getting to her feet and walked over to Kuching still holding her wrist. She lightened her grip, assuring Kuching that she wasn't mad or offended, to which Kuching followed by turning fully to face her friend. Knowing she was safe to release her, Ganyu released her hold entirely and just eyed her colleague in the dim light of the room. For eternity. Ganyu answered, causing both of their hearts to race like drums and send them into a trance of bliss.
Kuching's eyes twinkled like stars, hypnotizing Ganyu's senses as she lightly grabbed her friend's left hand and moved it to her right cheek. Upon her palm meeting Ganyu's face, Kuching didn't hesitate and planted her lips to her partner's, knowing she had been given the permission to do so. A passionate exchange of kisses followed, the two feeling and embracing one another in absolute passion. It was as if they were releasing a large amount of built-up pressure that had grown over a long period of time, giving each other what they both had wanted for so long. They shared each other's embrace for a long time, feeling like eternity to them, before they moved to one of the beds for further progression in their actions. Meeting their destination, the two engaged in a long display of the care and love they had for one another, shedding their clothes and exploring and satisfying one another throughout the hours of the calm night. While it had seemed unlikely, through trials and tribulations of true horror and tragedy, their true feelings had surfaced under the star-filled sky of Sumeru City. The next morning, Kuching fluttered her eyes open to the sight of Ganyu's bare form, wanting to shield her eyes out of respect up until she remembered the previous night. That was when she realized that she had nothing on under the sheets, feeling lost on what happened to lead to last night's events. Upon the sheets shifting from Kuching's movements, Ganyu turned her head to meet her love's gaze, a smile on her face. Good morning. She greeted cheerfully. Good morning, Ganyu. She greeted back with a smile. How are you feeling? To be honest, I'm exhausted, but I have to get up sometime today. Kuching giggled, becoming more comfortable with the gravity of the situation. I'm hoping that's an assurance that I did good. <laughs> you were amazing. How was I? You did great, Ganyu. I'm so lost. But I'm also happy about last night. It feels like a dream, doesn't it? <laughs> you're cute when you're silly. Mwah. Bath together? Kuching lifted the sheets, flashing her full natural form to her partner's eyes. After that, she got to her feet and embraced Ganyu by wrapping her arms lazily around her neck, following with a short kiss. Sure. She said cutely, giving her love another kiss and releasing her embrace. I love you. Ganyu smiled at the words. A blush meeting her face instantly. I love you too. She replied, allowing her partner to proceed to the bathroom to start their bath. As a tease, Kuching strutted in her pacing, causing Ganyu to stare in lustful glee. You naughty little thing. She teased in return. Kuching stopped and turned at the remark, a devious smile painted on her face. You're the one staring. Kuching countered, adding a wink of her eye to her statement. Ganyu rolled her eyes playfully in return, then started her way towards the restroom, shutting the door after to assure privacy in their hot and steamy alone time. To pass the time, seeing they literally had nothing to do until Yelam recovered the microchip, Ganyu and Kuching decided to just take a stroll around the entirety of Sumeru and take in the sights that its nature had to offer. In their journeying, the two didn't hide their newfound feelings, holding hands and walking closely together like a pair of lovers would. They had received some odd looks from passersby, but the two hadn't cared the slightest, enjoying the calm they had been granted in their current situation while they still could. They'd come across many different animals, bizarre plant life, several ruins of older Sumeru civilizations that had long since passed, 
and I just allowed the natural effects of nature to take over in the many hours of sightseeing. They had wandered around and just enjoyed their quality time together, up until they had grown a little exhausted from the high temperatures of the region. Therefore, they had decided to make their way back to the city and use some of the more Yelan had provided them to buy some lunch. Kuching had chosen a food stall where they could take their food elsewhere to prevent Ganyu from getting nausea from the overwhelming smell of meat dishes being cooked and served. It took about 10 minutes before they were served, and had taken their meals to a nearby field to enjoy. Ganyu had appreciated Kuching's concern, and the two were able to enjoy their first Sumerurian meal as a couple in absolute peace. In their time of enjoying the quizzing, the two had talked more than ever before only a small percentage of the conversation being related to the matter at hand, and seeming as if the world had gone back to normal for a short while. It was a short passage of time they had enjoyed and cherished as if it were their last meal together, and it very well could have been, so they had made sure to make every second count. After eating and concluding their exploration of the jungles of Sumeru, they had decided to call it a day and return to their room to relax for a while. And upon making sure to lock the door, the two engaged in another long session of giving each other pleasure and love in its purest form possible. The second time had felt less like a fantasy and more like a true display of passion and care for one another. They embraced and pleased one another for a good amount of time, up until they eventually succumbed to the effects of fatigue and bodily exhaustion, resulting in the two passing out in each other's arms comfortably. They slept for the majority of the day, up until one of them eventually opened their eyes to the now darkened room. Kuching had been the one to awaken first, her body still embraced with Ganyu's own, tightly and romantically. Her head rested against her beloved's upper chest, hearing every beat of their ancient heart as she moved to sit up against the backboard of the bed. Upon the slightest movement, Ganyu shifted as well muttering cute little moans in her sleepy state. Kuching smiled at the sounds, resting her back against the back wall, as she just allowed herself to temporarily wake up in the darkness. The only light was the moonlight peeking through the hidden cracks and crevices the building had gained over the years of its service, to which she was grateful, finding her way from under the sheets and moving to the provided bathroom to do her business. The coolness of the room tickled her bare naked body, as she lit a candle and proceeded with her bodily work. Once she'd finished, she just took a minute to eye herself in the mirror. The fact that the events of the previous hours and prior night were real made her just stop and smile, having never thought she'd end up with Ganyu of all people. To be honest, she had thought Ganyu was way out of her league during her time in Leiwei Harbor as the Yu Hung. But here she was, in Sumeru City, as naked as a newborn, after engaging with said person. It amazed her as she just continued to stare, and after another minute of thought, she finally returned to the bed to join her beloved in slumber. Surprisingly, she wasn't hungry for dinner, nor felt like she needed any such thing as food for the remainder of the night. All she needed to be was in Ganyu's soft and warm embrace dreaming and resting the night away. Upon moving back under the sheets and back to Ganyu's side, her love suddenly fluttered her eyes open like a butterfly attempting to take flight. Ugh, is something wrong? Ganyu questioned sleepily, her eyes halfway open. No, no, just need to use the bathroom, that's all. Ganyu nodded, letting out a long yawn. <sighs> Should we get up? Ganyu asked. Kuching shook her head, moving further towards Ganyu under the sheets and cuddling her body against her partners. I'm fine right here. Kuching answered with a wide and bright smile. Ganyu smiled in return, leaning over and planting a light kiss on Kuching's lips. <sniffs> Then let's just stay for the night. Ganyu suggested. Together. Kuching finished, moving to where she was comfortable against her beloved's warm and soft body. She wrapped her arms around Ganyu, 
to which her partner returned by wrapping her own around her and pulling her close. Once the two were relaxed in each other's embrace, they shut their eyes and returned to slumber, Ganyu being led by only a single thought that made her smile at the feeling of Kuching's body against hers. Always. Three knocks awoke Ganyu from the comfort of her slumber, still locked in Kuching's embrace and feeling her partner's soft breaths against her chest. She assumed the knocks as nothing but a fragment of a dream she couldn't recollect up until another three knocks came. Upon the sound meeting her ears again, she immediately panicked in embarrassment, having no clothes on under the sheets and not wanting to wake Kuching if she didn't need to. However, upon her beloved flickering her eyes open and muttering sleepy moans, she realized she wouldn't even need to try. They were both up now and wondering who in the world would be knocking at their door so early. Uh, who's at the door? Kuching whispered to Ganyu. Uh, I'm not sure, but we'd best say something before we potentially risk getting walked in on in our birthday suits. Ganyu replied, addressing the issue with the solution of simply calling out. Who is it? My colleague and I aren't dressed at the moment. A brief silence followed, up until a much familiar voice broke through. It's me. Yelan's voice came from behind the door. The professor and I have accomplished the task and I feel you two should be part of revealing whatever lies within the brain of the very monster who caused all of this. Ganyu calmed along with Kuching, but nonetheless, the awkwardness of the situation didn't falter. They both had adorned light blushes, but knew that the risk of some stranger walking in on both of them as nude as a newborn baby had dissipated. All right, give Kuching and I about an hour to get ready. Ganyu requested, very well. Meet me outside the academia to proceed further with the initial plan. Yelan agreed, and upon hearing her leave the perimeter of the outside of the door, Ganyu let out a long breath of relief. <sighs> that was a close call. Looks like we've avoided being discovered in our most natural forms for now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not the wake-up call we were expecting, that's for sure. At the end of that statement, Kuching found her way out of the bed and towards the bathroom. You bathing before we go? Kuching asked, turning to eye her beloved, still cloaked by the bed sheets. Ganyu nodded with a smile, lifting the sheets from her body and walking to Kuching's current position. After last night... I think it's best I clean up. Ganyu answered, to which her partner smiled lustfully. Then let's clean up our dirty work. A long hour passed before Ganyu and Kuching finally met up with Yelan, clearly on the edge of impatience after the long wait. Upon their approach, Yelan was the first to say something, folding her arms and giving an unreadable expression. And here I thought I was going to have to just move along and see the show for myself. Yelan stated in her usual tone of voice. By the way, congratulations. Ganyu and Kuching wore looks of confusion instantly, unsure what Yelan was congratulating them for. For what? Kuching replied, an eyebrow raised. You know, we're finally getting together. Yelan answered, to which Ganyu and Kuching both jumped and wore blushes instantly. Huh? How, how did you know? Kuching questioned in absolute embarrassment. Yelan just followed with a light chuckle. <laughs> Honey, there's only one reason why someone isn't dressed upon waking up. Yelan explained. 
I could tell from the tone of Ganyu's voice that I'd clearly awoken her from a deep sleep. So, it's pretty clear what you two were doing during my absence. However, don't worry. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Nor am I even surprised that you two ended up breaking the ice. You two have obviously been crushing on each other for so long. So, it was only a matter of time before you two finally threw all doubt out the window. Looks like all it took was some of the romantic magic that Sumeru naturally influences on lovers in denial. And for me to be out of the picture. Ganyu and Kuching's faces were as red as tomatoes, feeling as if they were going to vomit at the amount of embarrassment Yelon had just caused them. Beads of sweat ran down their faces, and their faces were as hot as a freshly picked Joyun chili as they tried to compose themselves. Y you don't have to be so d descriptive about it. Ganyu trembled out, having not been this embarrassed since Cloud Retainer had told Ether that she used to roll down mountains due to her being plump as a child. Heh, <laughs> perhaps that'll motivate you not to keep me waiting for over an hour. Yelon countered with a slight chuckle. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I am happy for you, Tail. It's a shame such a joyful event must be foiled by the cruel truth of our current predicament. Well, we appreciate the kindness, Kuching said with a heavy tone of embarrassment. H however, next time could you kindly not blurt it out in a public space? Yelon chuckled again. <laughs> Lady Kuching. These students aren't focused on us, but on their studies and the stress of acing their next big exam. I doubt they even heard a word I said. Kuching put her hands on her hips as an exclamation that she was serious. While she no longer was the Yuhong of Liwei Harbor, she still wasn't afraid to stand her ground. Yelon caught the exclamation and didn't piss her off any further. All right, all right. I'll be sure to just walk in on you two bare naked next time. She played. Is that better? Another blush adorned Kuching's face instantly at the words, not catching the humor of the comment. Miss Yelon! Kuching scorned. I'm kidding. Yelon followed. I'll be sure to respect your privacy from now on. I just figured we needed some humor before we figure out the source of all of this chaos. Kuching didn't follow in the same way, sighing heavily and rubbing her head. <sighs> I'm going to need at least two coffees after this stunt. Yelon sighed as an answer, following up with a simple comment. Fine, we'll get you two after this. Bear? Kuching nodded, and once Yelon was assured that her stunt was forgiven, she proceeded. Let's go meet up with our professor friend, shall we? Ganyu and Kuching nodded, then followed Yelon into the building and into Oswald's office where he was sitting in wait for their arrival. He looked no different from their first meeting, but was clearly excited for whatever was to come. Upon their arrival, he had jumped from his chair to greet them, and began to explain the next course of action. Welcome back to my office, ladies. I'll be honest, I hadn't expected to be back here so soon. But it turns out that the circuitry wasn't as difficult as I'd originally assumed to disassemble. While it was very much neatly and cleverly set up, with a little bit of analyzation and careful work, Miss Yelon and I were able to extract the microchip rather quickly. That's great to hear, sir. Very. The professor nodded his head, continuing his summary of the process. However, upon extraction, something struck me as odd. The chip was a type that I hadn't seen in decades, and that's because it's an older type that's designed to store mainly recorded data. Nobody uses these types of microchips anymore due to their fragile nature and being notorious for failure. 
John Yu and Ke Ching both eyed each other in deep thought. Why would someone like the Saritza settle for such faulty wear in a machine that is critical to her plan? That's definitely odd, seeing if the truth is what we assume and Reshav wasn't lying. It wouldn't make sense for such outdated and unreliable equipment to be what our enemy is settling for. Even the Conrian machines that we know as Ruin Guards and Ruin Hunters are designed with better technological components. So why would such a bad source of data that is critical to the main goal be in a machine capable of murder and mass genocide? Oswald sh shrugged his shoulders in response. The only answer that I can give is that maybe you'll find your answers in its stored memory. Yelon gave a nod, reaching into one of her pockets and gently slipping out the microchip. It was larger than Ganyu or Kuching assumed it would be, being rectangular, about the size of one of Ganyu's arrowheads, a dark blue color, and wearing a protective transparent shell. Yelon handed the chip to Oswald, to which he slipped the aged piece of technology into the proper cartridge of his computer. On the screen, a rectangular box with a single vertical line appeared, the words access code being just above. Already, they had run into an obstacle, which wasn't a good sign. Then came Yelon's response to the problem. <laughs> Don't worry, I know the code. She stated confidently, moving to the keyboard just below the monitor and typing some obscure grouping of numbers. 220-290-9022-023-1030. A robotic feminine voice came over the speakers of the device upon submitting the numbers, and upon it stating, Access Granted, all eyes met Yalon in amazement. What? You think during my years at the Ministry of Civil Affairs I didn't learn anything about common passcodes? In this case, the easiest way for access to this thing's data would be by making its passcode its serial number. That way, the person can identify them by that number and know for sure which android they are accessing. That's absolutely brilliant! Well done! Save the pleasantries, Professor. We've only managed to get past one wall of security. The most critical files will either be behind a code that has been memorized by one person and only one person, or it'll be corrupted. Oswald just nodded, proceeding further with the task. Upon breaking the code, a screen composed of a lineup of separate files met them. The numbers were clearly dates of documented information, the first dating over a whole century ago. The entire room was bewildered, now fully invested on just how far back Reshav's existence went. First one. We need to figure out where this all started. Oswalch obeyed and opened the first file. Its format was video and was very poor in quality, but Ganyu, Kuching, and Jalon Sa passed that and just watched further. The visuals were of what seemed like a lab, a young man dressed in a white lab coat being the only thing of interest within the camera's depth of field. <laughs> Success! I, I must record something. Something to commemorate the day that I, Dr. Salvik, created a successful device able to record and document anything it catches! The young and happy scientist left the view of the camera for about two minutes up until he returned with a small notebook and pencil. As an additional precaution, shall my invention suddenly fail, I am writing this in my work notebook. <clears throat> Today, I, Dr. Walter Selvig II of the Shneznayan Academy of Technology and Cybernetic Arts, have successfully managed to create and power on a functioning video recording device. This is my 27th attempt to do so after applying several modifications to the machine's circuit board and cycling parts that were non-functioning upon attempting to start up the invention. No name has been given thus far in my progress, nor any purpose, shall I manage to fully complete the machine. This is merely a test for testing purposes only, and I shall continue to progress my research and work on what I hope to eventually be a functioning assistant that can do a variety of tasks. 
<laughs> That's the future, though. Today, it's just one of the hopefully many successful advantages in this creation's growth. Let this be known as a day to be celebrated. And I hope to make another successful message like this in the near future. The video cut to black, leading them back to the screen with all of the other hundreds of video messages. It wasn't what any of them had been suspecting, and judging by the following dates on the screen, Dr. Solvik had definitely found many other successes. Definitely not the start I was expecting. Yelon commented. No kidding. Kuching added. To think. This all started with a struggling student looking for success. Where did it all go wrong? That's what I want to know next. So let's find where the dates took a drastic turn for the worst. Oswald followed, scrolling along the files until he found a date that had a massive gap in between the previous transmission. That was intriguing enough to catch Yelon's attention, so she directed Oswald to play it, another screen opening and beginning to play. The setting was the same, but this time, something was different. A woman. She was tall, dressed in a thick fur coat, had long curly snow white hair that extended down to her buttocks, and her eyes were dressed with a masquerade mask. The reason for the long gap was becoming clear now. However, upon hearing the audio, they were met with a surprise. Your Highness, I... 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 Dr. Salvik was in the company of the Tsaritsa, and from the looks of it, things weren't going to end well. My subject, calm yourself. I am merely here out of curiosity. Curiosity? Yes, you see, I've been hearing about your creation. I feel that I have a place for something as such, given what's on the horizon for Shneznaya. Your Highness, are you serious? My creation? Funded and produced by you? Allow me to explain, child. You see, I've had a vision for several centuries now, but my fellow brothers and sisters have just never seen it the way I do. They'd have my head if I tried to pursue what I believe in without proper action. And you wouldn't want to see that, would you? Of course not, your majesty. That's good to hear, my child. Therefore, I feel you'll have no trouble in hearing me out, seeing I am only doing this for the good of our home and Tevat altogether. You see... I want to use your creation to create what will be the foundation and starting point for a proper world without gods or inequality. This world has been in an imbalance ever since the conclusion of the Archon War, and to cleanse the world of that problem, all gods, including me, must be eradicated, along with anything that ever signifies the seven Archon's existences among human society throughout history. Dr. Salvik's face had fallen to nothing but a look of unsureness and horror. The Tsaritsa had literally asked him for the key to her and the other Archon's deaths. As much as mass genocide to all life in the world. You want me to provide you with machines of war? Not war, my child, but balance. You would be the person who helped to make this world a much better place without turmoil, judgment, or war. You'd be the cleanser of all of the evil in today's society. Salvik clearly wasn't following her, conflicted on his goddess's beliefs and whether or not he should sign the dotted line. But... My creation was never meant for the purpose of such. I just wanted to create something to help me with simple things. What you're asking is something I just can't see as anything good for the world. Forgive me, your highness. 
but while we do live in a world of gods where not everyone is an equal, I just don't see the good of killing gods to balance a world that the majority of us have grown accustomed to. I'm sorry, but I can't accept your offer. While I do want to be known as a genius and great inventor, this isn't the way, and I won't be swayed. The Saritza just stood motionless, but eventually she did say something, and everyone in the room knew nothing good was to come. Oh, dear child, you needn't apologize. I understand. You do? Absolutely. Who am I to put you into such a position? I respect your decision, and will honor it with a simple gesture. And what is that? By giving you all my love. In a sudden turn of her body, the Saritza landed a gash across Salvik's throat with a dagger she had managed to keep hidden, causing a splat of blood to obscure the lens of the camera. However, the picture remained clear enough for all of them to make out what was happening. The sudden turn of events had caused Ganyu to utter a gasp and cover her mouth in absolute horror at what she was witnessing, to which Kuching comforted her beloved at, remembering what Yelon had told her about her partner's PTSD. The scene continued to play out like a horror show, up until the Saritza pinned Salvik on the ground, but didn't treat it as if she were attempting to kill him. It's alright, my child. I'd never kill one of my own subjects. I just need an opening so I can give you my gift. She was calm and treating him as if she were actually her child. And upon her gripping his neck, a bright light radiated from her hand. Salvik attempted to scream, but had been silenced by whatever the witch had done to him. And the fact that he was clearly in excruciating pain and she was treating it as if she were giving him a gift was haunting to watch. The blinding light disappeared and Salvik was barely even moving, nothing but a faint dead rasp coming from his mouth. Hush now, my child. It's okay. Go to sleep. His rasp went silent at the end of those words, and his limbs went limp. The last piece of disturbing imagery the video had to show was the Saritza leaning down to lightly kiss his forehead. Don't worry. You are among greatness now, my child. However, your legacy will live on as my ascension to the divine ender of this world. She rose up from the ground and walked over to the recording device unmasking and revealing her piercing light blue eyes that appeared to be glowing and staring straight into their souls. And that rise starts with this. The screen went to black, and upon the screen returning to the default list of documented video files, Ganyu was in Kuching's arms crying at the grim imagery she had just witnessed. Kuching just held her close, Knowing what was in that video was only a fragment of the horrors her beloved had witnessed all those centuries ago. This discovery had affected all of them deeply, now aware that whatever was stored in that microchip was nothing short of a truly vivid horror show. Uh, let's take a break and come back to this after we've had a minute to erase that from our minds. Yelan stated, clearly shaken at the Saritza's grotesque act. Agreed. Kuching accepted, still holding Ganyu tightly. I need some fresh air after that. I think we all do. However, I'll need directions to the nearest tavern as well, seeing I'll need at least one drink before we go any further with this. After a good serving of a light drink, Yelon had managed to calm herself down. Kuching had just taken a long walk with her beloved around Sumeru to clear her mind and rest Ganyu's trauma. 
The two had needed a good amount of fresh air and nature after witnessing the coldest and most demented murder in their lives. Kuching had considered having one shot with Yelan, but was swayed by Ganyu upon the very mention of the thought. She needed to be fully aware of what was going on, not potentially buzzed out of an absolute disgusting horror show that she'd likely never forget. She'd seen Yelan do 10 glasses of rum with Ningguang and Beidou before, and remain completely unfazed, so a light drink wouldn't hurt her at all. The only person she was worried about was Ganyu, given the impact the horrid truth had caused her. No doubt her emotional reaction was due to her PTSD of losing Yunha to a bunch of bandits, along with just the sheer coldness of the Saritza's actions all that time ago. Kuching had seen a lot of disturbing things in her time as the Yuhung, but what she had just witnessed took the top spot, and was easily the worst thing she had ever experienced next to Liwei Harbor's end. After a long hour, the trio finally returned to Professor Oswalch's office, ready to endure whatever other horrors were documented in the brain of Reshov Starchovsky. Are you sure you girls are okay to continue? Oswalch asked with concern. We'll be fine. Kuching replied confidently. Shall things become too uncomfortable for any of us? We'll stop and leave for today. Very well. Which file do you want me to access next? He asked Jalon. Next one. I want to see what happened to Dr. Selvik after she coldly murdered him. Oswald followed, accessing the next available file. Upon the video window popping up, it started to play, opening to a whole new area. The room in this video was similar to an examination one, the walls painted a dull gray and one single eerie light illuminating the surrounding area. Nobody was visible, but the familiar voice of the Saritza could be heard within the vicinity, speaking some very haunting words. How is he? Is everything going as I had hoped, number two? Patience, my lady. An experiment cannot succeed without proper time and care. I have done as you requested, but I fear the prototype design may not be fitting for his body. If this is going to succeed, I'll need more resources that can work more steadily and balanced than what this subject was using to power his version. I'm willing to give you whatever works best for you, number two. But in return, I expect you to get things done within a reasonable amount of time. Have I failed you yet, your highness? Not yet. But even the most clever minds eventually dwindle like a fall leaf clinging to a branch in the middle of a raging blizzard. I have no doubt you can accomplish my goal. But I can't have your other experiments get in the way. While my brothers and sisters haven't caught on yet, they won't stay unaware forever. Very well. If you can get me the parts I need by the end of tomorrow, I may be able to at least get to a point where the subject can at least have a proper design and be somewhat functional. It won't be the final design, but a simple test of what I plan to do with this experiment. Is that a fair deal? Very well. List the part she requests, and I'll relay it to one of my inquirers. I'll have them take a trip to one of Shneznaya's main factories and request for them. And in the time you're getting my needed resources, I'll continue working on modifying his structure. Be patient, your highness. I promise that you won't be disappointed with the end result. With that, the video cut to black and yet another horrifying truth was realized. Reshov Starchovsky was a converted Dr. Selvik all along. Kuching analyzed. How sick do you have to be to do something so foul? Apparently sick enough to not only mutilate a dead body, but also clean it down to nothing but a giant slab of flesh. All of the things that made Selvik human were just discarded for the sole purpose of selfishness. The fact that this number two complied to this as if it were some kind of world-changing experiment is some other kind of evil. 
The room went silent for a moment, up until Oswald finally spoke up and addressed the clear unease and atmosphere of dread that suffocated the entire room. Do you want me to continue? No. I think we've all had enough for one day. If it gets any worse from here, it might end up causing some of us mental issues. It's best we stop for now, get a good rest, and come back to it tomorrow. I agree. Too much of this could be bad in the long run, especially if we end up facing her. Take it from me, a veteran of the Archon War, that the best thing to do right now is walk away for now and come back to this tomorrow with a fresh mind. Kuching nodded in agreement, having had enough real-life horror plague her mind for one day. It's settled then. Let's call it for today and we'll come back tomorrow to resume. Yelon finished, to which Oswald ejected the microchip and handed it back to her. Having come to an agreement, the three took their leave back to the outside of the academia and huddled to decide the next best course of action. <sighs> I'm glad that's over for one day. Ganyu said with a heavy sigh. Likewise. Yelon replied, while I came across some seriously messed up cases during my years in the Ministry of Civil Affairs, nothing involving whores like this ever crossed my path. I knew the Fatui were bad, but the Queen Bee is just something else entirely. Something more than evil, but demonic. Kuching shook her head in response. No. Human modification and experimentation of that caliber is more than demonic but just straight up inhumane, as if she has no care for human life in general. Kuching added, I'd always heard that the Sarita was a different kind of god, but as of today, I cannot even believe she is one. Gods at least have some form of care for their subjects, but she only cared about what she wanted. Which is exactly why if we manage to get to where we can end her life, we mustn't even hesitate or bat an eye. Yelon stated, You saw how fast she can end a human life, and she won't hesitate to do the same thing to any of us. Kuching and Ganyu nodded. Good. Now, if you girls don't mind, I'm going to the tavern to have an actual drink. Don't worry, I'm not going to get hungover drunk. I'm still aware I have a mission to accomplish, so I'll be sure to keep the shot count low. While Kuching and Ganyu weren't necessarily big on the idea of Yelon's plans, they knew they couldn't stop her. I suppose Ganyu and I will go out for dinner then. While what we witnessed was sick and disturbing on all levels, we still need to eat. Kuching stated, Sure. It just needs to fit my diet. Ganyu agreed. <laughs> I know that, silly. Kuching assured, a smile gracing her lips. Ganyu smiled back, grabbing her beloved's hand and gripping it in hers. <laughs> look at you, Tail. Yelon started. You're going to have a nice dinner while I go and drink alone. Sad, but poetic. You're more than welcome to join us, Ganyu offered. You don't have to drink to escape what happened today. A good night with your friends is all you need to be happy. I know, but I think it's best I have this one. Yelon insisted. You two need as much quality time as you can get as a couple, and I haven't had a good drink in a while. Ganyu just accepted Yelon's wishes. Kuching following up with a final request. In that case, perhaps it's best we hold on to the microchip for now. Last thing we need is to lose our most valuable piece of information right now. Good point. Yelon agreed, pulling the chip from her pocket and handing it to Kuching for safekeeping. Once the package was secured on Kuching's person, the three took their separate ways for the remainder of the day. Yelon waved goodbye moving towards the tavern below, while Ganyu and Kuching were left to decide where they wanted to dine for the night. While it didn't seem it, 
the two were in for a long night. Little did they know just how much the Saritsa's act had affected them mentally, and if they planned to get through what remained of Reshov's memories, they would need each other now more than ever. Ganyu's screams and heavy breathing awoke Kuching from her sleep, immediately jumping to her beloved's aid and comforting her. Ganyu! What's wrong? She assured, putting her hand on her partner's back and rubbing it. Upon the touch, her hand was soaked by the sweat that had seeped through Ganyu's nightgown, causing her to quickly grasp the severity of the situation. Despite the mass amount of sweat, Kuching continued to rub Ganyu's back in assurance that she was there by her side. Gods above! You're soaked! Kuching said in a concerned tone. Ganyu, calm down and breathe! Ganyu somehow heard her, slowly breaking from her state of fear and primal terror. However, upon reality coming back to Ganyu's senses, she suddenly started to break down and cry hard. That broke Kuching's heart, and immediately caused her to catch onto what had caused her current state. You saw her, didn't you? Kuching guessed. Ganyu answered with a nod of her head, still crying, shaking, and struggling to calm down. Kuching knew words wouldn't do anything so she resorted to pulling her beloved to her chest in a comforting embrace. Ganyu clasped onto her like a scared child and just allowed her tears to flow down her face, to which Kuching gently wiped away with the cloth of her own attire. Never had she seen Ganyu this scared or desperate for support. Whatever she had witnessed in her dream state had been enough to strike the fear of the heavenly principles into her soul. And all she wanted then and there was to feel safe. After about 10 minutes of comforting and consoling her beloved, Kuching was finally able to calm Ganyu down to where she could address the situation. I'm... I'm sorry. Ganyu spoke first, her arms still wrapped tightly around Kuching, but her emotional state calmed to a somewhat stable one. Don't apologize, Ganyu. Kuching addressed. I'm here for you. Always. Ganyu didn't say anything, just remained quiet and still while Kuching continued to rub and embrace her with love and support. It was only after a few minutes passed that Ganyu finally said something, her voice being shallow and frightened. She... she was there in my homeland, killing everything in sight. Your homeland? As in, where you originally were born? Kuching asked. Ganyu nodded her head slowly. Some, some hidden field in the mountains. My parents, Cloud Retainer, you, you were all there. Murdered and mutilated. Emotion crept into Ganyu's voice, so Kuching pulled her closer to her chest and started to gently rock. Shh. It's okay, Ganyu. I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. She comforted. I'll always be here, no matter what. More silence followed up until Kuching spoke again in the still silence of the room. You know, I saw her in my dreams too. She confessed, causing Ganyu's nerves to jump, turning to meet her beloved's gaze. I was already awake and haven't been able to sleep the majority of the night. It seems she got both of us. What, what did you see? 
Ganyu asked silently. What I've seen in the majority of my dreams lately. Fire, severely wounded people, and you. But the reason I'm not as stricken by that witch appearing in my dreams is because I know nightmares are just that. Nightmares. Fictional creations of your psyche based off of things that you've experienced in real life. Nothing that's real or can hurt you. Ganyu loosened her hold just a little, still shaken from the visceral imagery her mind had conjured out of the previous day's events. She understood what Kuching was saying, but her case was more than just a simple nightmare. It was personal. I... I understand. But... Ganyu sat up from her beloved's chest continuing to stare at Kuching with a serious and emotional expression. What I saw, it's something that, that I... Ganyu paused, the topic something more severe and sensitive than Kuching had assumed. Kuching lightened her beloved's struggle, putting a hand to her shoulder and assuring her that it was okay. What? What is it, Ganyu? Ganyu took a deep breath and let it out before she said anything, doing her best to hold the tears attempting to break from her tear ducts. <sighs> Please know that I love you more than anything, but there's just some things I don't like to speak of from my past. They're just too painful to talk about, and were forgotten for a reason. Kuching was slowly beginning to understand and completely resonated with Ganyu's reasoning. Some memories are just meant to be forgotten. Then she spoke again. But I love you and trust you more than anybody in this world. And as your partner, I feel that you should know this. That way, on nights like these... You'll know the true reason why I awake screaming and crying like a child lost in the dark. I know very well that this won't be the last time. So rather than make you worry, I'd rather you know. Coaching nodded and accepted the proposal. Then please, tell me. But only if you feel like you can. The last thing I want is to see you in any kind of pain. So take your time. I'm all ears. Kuching assured. Ganyu nodded, taking another deep breath and allowing herself a moment before recollecting one of her most painful memories. <sighs> There's a reason Cloud Retainer found me in the Wedge of a Rock. And I remember exactly how I got there. It's... it's because I hid there after my fellow Chilin were killed by a bunch of bad people that resemble the treasure horrors of today's world. Kuching felt her heart skip a beat, realizing exactly why Ganyu had relented on even saying anything about this. This was one of the most traumatic memories of her entire existence the devs of her first ever family. Strangely, I don't remember anything before it all started. Just from when my mother started yelling for me to... to run, and my father guarding both of us from the attacks. I was so scared, confused, and stuck in place. Even though my mother was telling me to move, and get out of there before... before it was too late. She clenched her fists in a mix of sadness and anger, remembering every detail of the visceral memory. I just remember my father's blood being everywhere after he lost to the blows. And once his body fell, I was met with the sight of blazing fires. My family being mutilated for profit, and in a desperate attempt of escaping the same gruesome fate, 
I just ran as fast and as far as I possibly could. Those monsters chased me for miles, up until I ended up within Mount Ochong's range and crawled into that crack in hopes of my pursuers losing track of me. I... I got lucky and passed out. Up until the day, Cloud Retainer found me and took me in as one of her own. Kuching felt anguish pierce her heart. Now fully aware of the clear reason her beloved had kept this memory buried away. No human or defined beast would want to relive the day that they lost everything that they held dear. It's a pain that is indescribable to even experience. And for Ganyu to be willing to tell her this was something that was truly important to Ganyu. I... I'm so sorry, Ganyu. Kuching sympathized. You, you must have been so scared when Cloud Retainer found you that day. It's why I was so afraid to attempt living amongst the very kind that slaughtered my family for so long. But Yunha was the one who showed me that not all humans are monsters. So, when another bunch of bandits took the only thing besides Cloud Retainer that I considered family away, now you understand, truly, why it was more than just grief and anger that truly drove me to the point of no return. Rex Lapis was the one to show me that I couldn't be scared of humans, and that I just had to try. It took over a century, but at the closing of the Archon War, I gave human society one last chance. The rest is history. Up to the night our home was destroyed. Kuching just continued to eye her beloved in absolute sorrow. She was beginning to understand why Ganyu was truly leery of humans and society. That amount of trauma had left her scarred because humankind had taken everything from her. There was no doubt why she was so distant from humans and society and Kuching felt every bit of Ganyu's sorrow and pain. I... I get it now. Kuching explained. Humans are like a bad omen in your eyes, and that's why you're so against being social with them. Ganyu nodded, confirming Kuching had managed to catch why that specific memory was so impactful to her psyche. It was where her pain all started, and to relive the day that had changed her for eternity in her dreams was nothing short of a true traumatic horror movie. The Saritza was just a bonus factor that had worsened the pain. This is something I'm sharing for the first time, which means that you are someone I trust and love as much as those who raised me. Ganyu explained, I wouldn't tell you this unless I knew that I truly loved and cared for you, and knew that I was confident that we both felt the same way about each other. Not even Cloud Retainer knows the truth. Kuching blushed at the sentiment, feeling her heart race at Ganyu's confession and dedication to the relationship. I'm flattered, and I love you too, Ganyu. Kuching returned. I understand everything now, but I just want you to know that you're not the same girl Cloud Retainer found in that rock wedge. She put a hand on Ganyu's left cheek and curved her lips into a reassuring smile. You've grown and matured so much, and I've seen it from the first day we met. Signing up for the position of Yu Hunk was the best thing that I ever did because it led me to you. From the first day, I looked at you as the most bravest, intelligent, and beautiful woman in the world. And I will always look at you as that. While things are the way they are right now, you've remained strong and have shown that you are far from the scared little girl you were back then. Your family would be so proud of you. 
and I'm sure they're looking down at you right now with absolute support and love. As long as we're together, there's nothing to fear. And somehow, we will stop the Saritza and save Tevat from destruction. Ganyu adorned her own blush, her heart pounding at her beloved's words. She smiled and embraced Kuching in a warm hug, her tears dissipating at the happiness fluttering in her heart. I feel better now. Thank you, my love. Ganyu stated, releasing Kuching from her hold. You're welcome, my beloved. Kuching replied, moving back down onto her pillow and motioning Ganyu to join her back into slumber. Come and lay your head on my chest. My heart will put you into a peaceful dream. Ganyu accepted and cuddled up against Kuching's side, laying her head along her partner's upper chest and allowing the drum in Kuching's chest to carry her back to sleep. Kuching comforted her love by stroking the top of her horns gently, a privilege that she'd never seen anybody receive except her. Ganyu smiled and muttered light moans of comfort at the motion of Kuching's soft hands brushing the most sensitive parts of her body, remembering how her mother used to do the same to send her to sleep. It was a sweet memory that turned into a happy dream that allowed her peace for the remainder of the night. Upon Ganyu and Kuching's arrival at the outside of the academia the next morning, they were surprised that Yelon hadn't looked as if she'd just gotten out of bed. Kuching's little mishap with alcohol nearly a decade prior had had her arriving to the Jade Chamber looking like an absolute exhausted mess with a pounding headache. So to see Yelon composed and as if she hadn't gone out for a good round of shots the night prior had surprised the two lovers. Not even a single sign or smell of alcoholic activity lingered on their co-worker's person, which was both a relief and shock, given their objective not far ahead. Yelin caught their shock, quickly addressing it. <laughs> you two seem bewildered at something, and I think I can guess what it is. She stated, You're wondering why I don't even seem like I went out to the tavern last night. And that's because I did, but traded the alcohol for something better. You girls can't have all the fun. Blushes adorned both Kuching and Ganyu's faces, reading the message loud and clear. All right, all right, that's all you need to say. We get it. Kuching said quickly. Hopefully you just kept yourself protected from... You know. Oh, don't worry, honey. I wouldn't go and do something like that without knowing I was in the right mind. Yelon assured. I'm clear, I assure you. Good. Kuching replied, following with a long sigh. <sighs> I don't know if I'm prepared for another seating of this. Ganyu put her hand on her shoulder as a way of comforting her beloved, calming Kuching a little, but not fully, feeling the same about the whole matter. Don't worry, seeing we have the majority of what we need to know about how this all started, there's only one last thing to focus on. Yelon confirmed. All we need is a location or some form of idea where all of these androids are being produced. We already know Reshot was originally an aspiring inventor that was killed and converted into a machine that I decapitated. No more information about him is needed. We just need to know where to go to stop it all. I doubt those files will have more visceral nightmarish imagery, Lady Kuching. Kuching nodded, realizing that Yelon was absolutely right. They only needed one more piece of information and nothing else on Reshov. Therefore, she calmed her nerves and prepared for their entry into the building. Alright, then with that information, 
I'd say we've been in Sumeru long enough. Kuching said confidently. Let's go finish what we came here to do. Yelan smiled and nodded. Now you're speaking my language. Let's go. With that, the three moved into the building and made their way to Oswalch's office. Upon entry, the professor was sitting in the same spot in wait for their arrival. He didn't get up and just awaited Yelon's commands on what to do. I hope you are all well rested. He greeted. I am truly sorry we all had to witness such horrid imagery yesterday. And I do hope it didn't cause any of you problems. Ganyu and Kuching decided to keep their eventful night to themselves, seeing what they had discussed was something that only they should know as lovers. They just shook their heads along with Yelon, allowing their plans to proceed. I'm glad. Now, if one of you will kindly hand me the microchip, we can get started. He followed up. Yelon nodded, directing to Kuching for the item of interest. Kuching followed pulling the object from where she had hid it safely on her person and handing it to Yelon. Yelon proceeded by handing the ancient component to Oswald, and upon him entering the chip into the proper slot of his computer, resumed their work from where they left off. The same list of several video files filled the screen, to which Yelon examined and decided the course of action. This one. She decided, pointing to the third from the last document. Oswalch raised an eyebrow at the declaration, wondering why Yelon had decided to skip so many files. Miss Yelon, if I may, why do you want to skip so many files with potentially critical information? Simple. Reshov, or Dr. Solvik, is not our target in this endeavor, but where he was modified and successfully created as a killing machine. Those files likely contain the steps of his creation process but we're looking for something else. Something that will not be in the video's foreground. Therefore, I'll need you to go slow and for all of us to keep a sharp eye out for things in the background. Ah, I see. I'll do my best. Yelan nodded, following with Oswalch pulling up the video file. There was an immediate key difference. The camera's quality was much clearer and cleaner than the prototypes had been. However, something about the video was much different. The location. Reshov was in Liwei Harbor, and it still looked like the city that they all had known and loved. No fire. No chaos. No death. Just old and peaceful Liwei Harbor. This sparked emotion immediately as much as opened up a whole new path of possibilities. Stop! Yelan ordered, clearly emotionally stricken. Kuching and Ganyu shared the same response, just continuing to stare at the likely last footage of their home before it was destroyed. They were stunned, happy, and sad at the same time. That's... our home. Kuching's voice was a mix of emotions. That's... Liwei Harbor. She smiled at the sight of her home, tears leaking from her eyes. However, upon realizing the horrid truth of the footage, she realized that this session was going to be much harder to watch than yesterday's. No, I can't watch that again. Please... Please don't make us relive that night again. Ganyu immediately comforted her beloved, sharing her thoughts entirely. It's okay, girls. I'd never make you endure that pain again. However, I can and would like to find out what all happened that night. That is, after we're done here. Oswalch nodded. Then... Having caught that the video was clearly a bad omen for the girls, he exited the file. Only when the screen was clear of the sights of Liwei Harbor did Kuching and Ganya return their gazes to the screen and wipe their eyes clean of their tears. However, 
Having known that the footage was before the destruction of Liwei Harbor, Yelan now had a good idea of where she needed to go next, pointing to the video file three more back from the current one. This one. If he was in Liwei Harbor in that file, then his time before leaving wherever he's maintained in Shneznaya isn't far behind. That's where we'll find what we're looking for. Oswald followed, and upon the video playing, Yelan had been right. On the screen was the visual of some kind of docking area with a mild amount of snow obscuring the camera's view. Bingo. Yelan stated, knowing they'd hit the jackpot. As the video kept playing, a giant ship anchored to the side of a long concrete walking area came into view. A very familiar lady dressed in a fur coat standing with her back to Reshav. Stop. Yelan commanded, to which Oswald obeyed, pausing the video. Yelan examined the scene thoroughly for a long minute, up until she broke the silence with a snap of her fingers. Ganyu and Kuching had no clue what she had found, but just allowed their colleague to state her findings. That ship. That isn't any ordinary ship. Moshna's nine ships are simple luggage and storage ships made out of a variety of strong woods. This one is made out of metal, and is massive in size in comparison to other ships that were ever documented to have docked Leeway Harbor's docks. That means two things. First, it's meant for other purposes outside of luggage and storage of goods to other regions. Let's leave that alone for just a second and talk about the other factor. It's meant to transport loads of massive numbers. I can tell that just by its height. And the fact that it's made out of metal proves that whatever it's meant to transport is meant to be kept extra safe from the water. Do you get where I'm going with this, girls? It took a second, but after a moment of thought, Kuching and Ganyu caught onto everything. The ship is specifically designed for transporting the androids to somewhere within Shneznaya's region, and this area that Reshav is in is the place that he and the other androids are maintained. Exactly. There's never been any ships like this within Liwei Harbor's borders, and that means it's a ship meant for one specific purpose. Loading the androids and transporting them from point A to point B. The fact Jalon had caught all of that from a ship's size and the location had amazed Ganyu and Kuching. It was no wonder she was the Ministry of Civil Affairs top dog. Her expertise showed it alone. Now, where is this place? I think I already know how to determine that. But to do that, I need a map of Shneznaya and time. Using my plan technique, I think I can figure out where point A and B both are. Oh, I just happen to have a map of Shneznaya right here. Excellent. Thank you for your contribution, Professor. Yelon thanked, taking the map and looking at it carefully. She slid her index finger around an outer area of the region where it seemed there was nothing but sea, but Kuching and Ganyu could see exactly what she was doing. Alright, let's see how long our android friend takes to get to wherever point B is. Run the footage, Professor. Oswalch did as he was instructed, resuming the footage and allowing the footage to play out. Be sure to start the time from when the ship takes off. We can't be off by much. I'll use my Akasha. Oswald confirmed, starting to fidget with the device fixed to his right ear and paying attention to the footage. The video consisted of Reshav boarding the giant ship and joining an alarming amount of his other brethren in their journey. There were easily over 50, and that twisted a knot in all three of their stomachs, now aware that Reshav hadn't been lying that there were hundreds more of his kind waiting to commence the Saritza's plan upon a simple command. Upon taking his proper spot in the lineup of robotic creations, the video just turned into a long projection of the same footage. However, upon the sound of the ship's anchor lifting, Oswald had started timing the footage for consistency in Yelan's plan. The video lasted for a long while up until the anchor dropped again, 
and Yelan had the information she needed. Oswald stopped the timer and gave Yelan the time of travel from point A to point B, still clueless how she was going to figure out where these locations were. 4,214 seconds was the full time. Oswald confirmed. After doing some calculations, Yelan simplified her answer to something she could use to determine what she was planning. So, around an hour, 10 minutes, and 14 seconds. Perfect. Now, we just need to see where he is now and get a good idea of everything. Oswalch followed, resuming the footage and allowing his audience to analyze. The recording followed with Reshov getting off the ship and stepping out onto a long concrete walkway very similar to the place he had started from in the file. However, one key factor caught their attention. Only Reshov moved, not his fellow androids. That was intriguing and was enough for Yelan to order Oswalch to stop the video. Stop. She ordered calmly. Oswald listened and halted the video footage from progressing any further. <laughs> Sneaky bastards. Unfortunately, they left one opening that can lead us right to them. What did you find? Kuching questioned. Yelan crossed her arms and expressed a confident smile. Well, the concrete is there as a signal to whoever mans the ship. These docks are in areas where nobody can really determine the location for the sake of security. But location and scenery aren't the only way of determining a location. You see, I was paying attention to the ship's course for the entire duration of the video. Every turn, how long it lasted, and most importantly, what direction the bow was facing before Reshov boarded the ship. That way... I know what way the ship is going from the moment it starts its voyage. If I know the directions it's going, I can determine exactly where these places are by doing careful measurements by mapping it out. The only thing I can't figure out is the reason those other copies didn't follow. However, it does confirm one thing. There's more than just one stop for these things. This was just Reshav's. Miss Yelan, your skills are truly amazing. Ningguang chose smartly when she made you her inquirer. I'm flattered, but don't praise me yet, hon. Our work is done here, but if we're going to pinpoint exactly where these places are, we'll need an expert. Kuching nodded. Then, with their business settled, Yelan turned to Oswalch and made it clear that his work was complete. Thank you for all of your help, Professor. As far as they're concerned, this business is concluded. However, I'd like to still take a good look at the footage of Leeway Harbor, seeing it just might have some information we need. That, and I want to know the entirety of what happened that night. Ganyu and Kuching took that as their cue to depart not wanting anything to do with a replay of that dreadful night that still haunted them to their cores. They got up and made their way back out into the open air and sunshine of Sumeru, allowing themselves to just breathe and relax. While they had made progress in their fight against the Saritsa, they still knew there was a long way to go and it was far from over. Let's go get some coffee at the cafe, Kuching offered wanting to just have some good old Joe after a much stressful morning. I'm all for that. Ganya replied. After that, I'd like to go back to the room and wash up before we leave Sumeru. That's fine with me. We can even bathe together if you want. I wouldn't have it any other way than with you, my love. Ganya finished taking Kuching's hand in hers and beginning to lead them to Puspa Cafe for a serving of the energy-inducing beverage they both adored dearly. Kuching followed, smiling and allowing Ganyu to guide her to the lower streets of Sumeru City.
After a good few cups of java, Kuching and Ganyu returned to their room and proceeded with washing up for the long trip to wherever Yelan planned to take them next. They didn't expect their host back anytime soon, so they just allowed themselves to enjoy their time together in the natural warm water of the tub. They washed each other thoroughly and romantically, just enjoying each other's company until it came time to depart the Nation of Wisdom. You know, you have one beautiful body, Ganyu. Kuching complimented, admiring her beloved across from her. Uh, oh, uh, well, so do you. Oh, please. I'm average in comparison to you. Average is an insult to how beautiful you are, my love. Oh, and what makes me beautiful to you? Kuching questioned, a cocky smirk adorning her face. Ganyu didn't even need to think for her answer. Everything. But the first time we ever met, I remember that the main thing that caught my attention was your eyes. They were, and still are, my favorite thing about you, next to your personality. And why is it you like my eyes so much? Many reasons, honestly. Your eyes have a mesmerizing effect to them. And when they twinkle in the light of day, they make your natural beauty shine through like a blazing star in the night sky. Kuching gasped in slight embarrassment, but appreciated everything Ganyu was saying about her. She smiled in appreciation and eyed her partner with absolute adoration. What about me? What do you mean, Ganyu? What makes me beautiful to you? I told you why you're beautiful to me. So now it's your turn. <laughs> well, just like you said, there's many things. Your personality, your strength, that cute ass. And I'd be lying if your eyes weren't part of it either. Ganyu was as hot as the water, mainly due to the comment about her behind. But nonetheless, she was intrigued. My, my ass? What's so cute about that thing? No reason, it's just cute in my eyes. She answered sarcastically, quickly turning more serious. <laughs> no, the truth is that it's a part of you, so I love it. To show she meant it, she leaned forward and gave Ganyu a reassuring kiss, to which her beloved accepted and took as a true sentiment. It only lasted for about five seconds, but to them, it was an eternity whenever they were in each other's embrace. Upon Kuching releasing the kiss, Ganyu smiled in reassurance. You are so inappropriate, but I love that about you. Nothing you'd expect from the former Yu Hung of our old home, huh? Don't even play like you don't like mine. I see you stare at it all the time, naughty lamb. Ganyu felt her body jump in temperature from that comment her adrenaline and hormones beginning to rush like raging rapids. She had to do everything she could to resist just lunging forward into her love's lips and leading her to the bed. Easy there, Kuching. <laughs> we can do that later. For now, we need to be awake for Yela. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to tease you a little. I didn't realize you were that vulnerable. It's okay. I love when you tease me, but yeah, you've got me a little too hot, so lower the naughtiness for a while. Alright, I'll tone it down until it's more of an appropriate time, but now I feel bad and want to make it up to you. No, it's okay my love, I know you didn't mean anything. No, I feel too guilty, therefore let me at least... She put a finger to her chin, brainstorming something she could do to show Ganyu she was truly sorry for accidentally arousing her. It took a moment, but eventually she found a solution. Ah, perfect. Let me give you a massage. She requested. Ganyu definitely wasn't against that idea, seeing she could definitely use one. Between the stress of the past week and a half and her past, she was more than due for a good unknotting of her back muscles. Alright, 
If it'll make you feel better, I'll let you massage my shoulders. Deal? Deal. With that, Ganyu followed through with their agreement by shifting her body to where her back was facing Kuching. She pulled her massive fleece over her shoulders and blanketed her breasts with it, allowing her beloved full view of her slightly muscly back for the task ahead. Kuching tucked herself up to Ganyu enough for her to get into a good position, then started by gripping her beloved shoulders. With care and a gentle grip, she began to lap her hands in a repeat pattern, leading to Ganyu beginning to react to Kuching's work on her tight muscles. As Kuching continued her motions, she could feel the years of work that her partner's muscles had endured, and as she dug and untightened the ancient damage, Ganyu reacted accordingly. She moaned and breathed hard at the work Kuching was doing, and Kuching could tell that they were not moans of pain or discomfort. These were exclamations of relief and pressure, and she just gave her all of it. She was surprised she didn't hear any pops or didn't manage to accidentally hurt Ganyu once. The task was like digging through concrete, and upon finishing the apologetic gift, Ganyu felt as if her movement speed with her arms had increased tenfold. Oh, Rex Lapis above, that felt so good. Thank you, my love. I feel so much better. You're welcome. You were so tight, so I'm sure undoing all of those nasty knots helped you. They did. Very much. I'll have to return the favor next time. I'd love that, my sweet. Ganyu reverted her position back to facing Kuching and laid back against the rim of the tub. I haven't had one of those in centuries, so my apologies if my muscles nearly broke your fingers. It's just part of beating a couple. My fingers are pretty tough, thanks to my use of the sword, so they aren't even sore. <laughs> I've had experience with them, so I know just how tough and soft they are. Ganyu teased, causing Kuching to blush and become slightly hot from arousal. G ganyu uh, I thought we were taking it easy on the naughtiness. You're making me hot just saying that. <laughs> now we're even. Ganyu stated with a giggle, leaning forward and kissing her flustered partner. Releasing the kiss, she got up from the water and got out, motioning for Kuching to follow. Come on, we should get ready before Yelon comes and gets us. Fine. She agreed, getting up and stepping out of the tub. But you owe me when we get to an appropriate place. Fair. The two cut the teasing and proceeded to getting dressed and packing up for their departure. It took them about an hour, and upon them finishing up, they just sat down and awaited Yelon's arrival. Where do you think we're going next? Ganyu pondered. I'm not sure, but I don't care where we go as long as I'm with you. Kuching answered. Like I said last night, as long as we're together, nothing can stop us. Ganyu nodded in response. Sumeru sure has changed us since we've arrived, hasn't it? We came here as clueless victims looking for answers, and now, we're leaving as informed lovers that are one step closer to figuring out how to resolve this madness. Kuching nodded. Sumeru brought out a lot in us, and gave us wisdom on how to progress in this fight. This truly is a place that lives up to its reputation. A sudden eruption of three knocks broke the silence of the room, following with a voice they had hoped to hear. You two better not be messing around in there, because boy do I have much to tell you. Spoke the voice of Yelon from the other side of the door. Nope, we're ready. <laughs> no naked lovers this time. Good, because we've got a boat to catch in 20 minutes. Meet me at the city docks and I'll tell you everything on the boat once we're out of the ears of society. A set of steps vacated the door's outer proximity, to which Kuching grabbed her beloved's hand and stated one thing. Ready to go, my love? Ganyu nodded as an answer, 
following with her own final goodbye to Sumeru. To wherever the road leads us next.